Next, we're going to turn to Dr. Greg Mollett, who is an HIV researcher and a policymaker. Um, Dr. Mollett is vice president at AMFAR. This is the Foundation for AIDS Research, uh, which is a leading organization dedicated to uh, support for AIDS research um, and HIV prevention. Um, Dr. Millet has a really unique perspective uh, into the role of a scientist uh, who's all, also been a policymaker, having been uh, both a scientist for the CDC and also a former White House staffer in the Office of National AIDS Policy. And in fact, that is where he co-wrote President Obama's first national HIV AIDS strategy. So very timely to have uh, Dr. Millet join us today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much for the invitation. It really is a pleasure uh, to be here today to speak about uh, policy issues uh, and coronavirus as well as HIV, um, as well as to be a part of this distinguished panel. Um, today, I really want to talk about um, COVID-19 and HIV and past this prologue and some of the parallels um, that I've seen in our responses to the HIV epidemic, as well as our responses to the COVID epidemic. Now, there was an article just a couple of weeks ago um, from the New York Times saying that COVID-19 has changed how the world does science together. And, and it's true um, for many researchers um, who have worked, um, particularly um, in the global south, um, there was a lot of work that was being done in various villages or other work in the developing world, but now it's different with COVID-19 because it's our own backyards. Um, and there are several scientists in the piece who remarked on the closest comparison to that moment was really the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic in the 1990s, um, when scientists worldwide uh, were really locking arms to help combat that disease. And we're seeing exactly that same thing that's taking place right now in terms of COVID. Um, where I think the parallel would also be helpful is to talk about some of the similarities that we see not only between uh, COVID and HIV, but some of the more recent syndemics or multiple overlapping epidemics that we've seen with the opioid crisis and HIV and then overlay COVID on top of that. Um, many of you are aware that we have a burgeoning opioid crisis that's been taking place in the United States over the last 15 years. Um, and there have been a lot of parallels that people have made between the opioid crisis as well as the HIV epidemic. One of them being that there have been a rapid increase in deaths for both, um, that there was a slow government response in the face of the crisis that there was a tendency to blame and stigmatize victims that also hampered our responses to that crisis, that there's inefficient funding, um, and also a failure to scale up effective interventions or policies. Um, now, this is true for HIV. This is certainly true for the opioid crisis. But I'd also argue that a lot of this is also true to our response to COVID-19 as well. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about and in, in, in how we see some of these similar responses is to talk first about the opioid epidemic and the huge HIV outbreak that took place in Scott County, Indiana back in 2014. Now, I'm a former CDC scientist. I used to work on outbreak investigations all the time. Uh, the outbreak investigations that I worked on were never more than about 50 people who became infected with HIV. This outbreak was really uncharacteristic because over 200 people became infected with HIV over a very short period of time. And it was in a county where there are only five HIV infections annually. Um, this is the epidemic curve of that outbreak. And you can see that it peaked around April 2015 with about uh, 22 people who um, um, seroconverted once they became tested. When you can see the decline in the epidemic curve, that's exactly when uh, needle exchange programs were implemented. Needle exchange programs are evidence-based programs that we know reduce HIV infection, hepatitis C infection, plus it serves as a safe space to get people into treatment um, who are people who inject drugs. However, after the outbreak, we also saw that Indiana rolled back um, the needle exchange programs um, in various places. This was based upon clashes with the Attorney General and the CDC over the use of needle exchange programs. So even though we've had this incredible intervention that worked, um, that's based upon science that we've known about for the past 30 years, it was actually rolled back in the very state where they had this huge um, number of HIV infections over a short order. And part of the reason why we see some of these rollbacks, and the first thing I want to discuss, is that when we talk as scientists about things that are effective for policymakers, those things that are effective also have to be popular within their constituents. Um, these are polls that were taken recently. One um, was with Politico and Harvard. The other one is a Hopkins Bloomberg survey. 
and they simply asked Americans whether or not they supported needle services programs or syringe services programs. And you can see in one poll, the support was 47%. Um, in the other poll, it was 40%. Um, now, this is a problem because we've had needle exchange programs for well over 30 years. Uh, the science is very clear that they work, but still the majority of Americans do not support them, uh, which makes it very difficult uh, for us to actually actualize them on the ground um, 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 with policymakers. Another thing that we see in terms of the HIV epidemic as well as the COVID epidemic is border restrictions. Very early in the HIV epidemic, the US locked down its borders, uh, did not permit people who were HIV positive to travel um, to the US. Um, that remained in effect for about 22 years. We're seeing the same thing that's taking place with our current administration where there were restrictions fairly early in January from the travel from the US to China. Um, however, um, and this is where, you know, the importance of science comes in, uh, we saw that most of the infections that are actually taking place in the United States and, and, and in New York City um, came from Europe, um, from some genomic research that was reported about a week ago. Um, and there's also the fact that there's a chance that coronavirus might have been here in the U.S. before January. This is exactly the same thing that we saw with the HIV epidemic. By the time that they closed the borders, it really didn't make sense because we already had such high prevalence within the United States and closing the borders wasn't going to help anything. I think the other parallel as well was we see the rise in xenophobia right now um, among Asian Americans um, um, in, in the United States um, and quite frankly all over the world uh, because of the um, coronavirus epidemic. And you saw the same thing at the very beginning of the epidemic with HIV with when um, particularly gay men um, as well as people who are of Haitian descent um, and IV drug users were highly stigmatized. I think another parallel that we see is balancing safety of healthcare workers versus privacy and stigma. Uh, just in the last couple of weeks, both Alabama and Massachusetts are proposing uh, to actually give out the addresses of people with coronavirus for first responders. They wanna make sure that first responders do not become infected and are aware of who has COVID within each one of their states. The problem with this though, is that it really ignores something that we learned from the HIV epidemic, uh, that you can actually um, balance privacy and not promote stigma by just practicing universal precautions. You assume that everybody has HIV. It's something that we could do as well with COVID. You should assume that everyone has COVID uh, rather than handling and, and, and promoting um, sensitive information such as addresses and names that can lead to stigmatization for people. Something else that we learned from HIV is tracking populations at highest risk. In order to really be effective in addressing HIV, you need to track those populations at highest risk. And in HIV and by race and ethnicity, African-Americans are at disproportionate risk for, for HIV. Um, unfortunately, we're seeing the same thing with the COVID response as well. Um, Gerard um, mentioned in the first presentation that there were various studies, or rather studies of uh, um, health department um, information that came out showing disproportionate impact in African American communities all across the US. However, um, we've been tracking some of these data on our AMFAR website. And up until two weeks ago, most of the states that you see here on the left hand side were red. They actually didn't have any demographic information around the COVID response. Um, and only a smattering had information on age or sex demographic data, but certainly not race and ethnicity. Because of the news coverage that's taken place over the last couple of weeks, we're seeing more and more states that actually have these data by race and ethnicity. But take a look on the right hand side. Uh, CDC just released yesterday the data that many of these states are providing on race and ethnicity, and it's still incredibly problematic um, because this response is so rapid, because there's so many people who are coming in, uh, because providers really don't have the time uh, for proper intake to track who's most at risk and to, to notate everything by race and ethnicity. You could see that in terms of missing information by race and ethnicity, 78% of all of those data are actually missing. We don't know um, if they were African American, if they were Latino, if they were American Indian, white, or other. So that's something else that we need to do a better job at and to try and figure out before the next outbreak how we can do something better to track those populations at highest risk. Unfortunately, these disparities also continue when you take a look at new technologies and impacted populations. One thing that's axiomatic that you see over and over again is when there's a new health technology that's introduced, those communities that need it the most are least likely to get access to that technology. So we're seeing that right now with coronavirus, uh, where the individuals who are wealthy or in another part of town with the zip code um, that is wealthier are more likely to get access to uh, testing for coronavirus, for COVID-19, whereas those groups who come from disenfranchised populations are least likely to do that. 
we see the same thing with HIV. There is something called PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. It's a pill that you take every day that prevents you from getting HIV, even though we know that African Americans and, dis and Latinos are disproportionately affected by HIV, they're least likely to have access to PrEP. And these are just data from CDC citing the percentage of African Americans and Latinos who would benefit from PrEP but then the reality of how many were actually prescribed or taking PrEP, which is pitiably low. So that's the second thing that we see is that whenever there's a new technology that the populations that need it the most are less likely to get it. So some of the things that I, I could think like to just share in terms of getting through to policymakers and looking forward to speaking about these and other things a little bit later as well. The first is that, you know, just appealing to policymakers around science, and science alone perhaps is not enough. Sometimes it's best to talk about costs and what's the cost of an outbreak within your community. This is um, part of the graphic that we put together while the outbreak was taking place in Scott County, Indiana several years ago, uh, where we compared the cost of a syringe services program, which is only $135,000 a year back then. And then we compared that cost um, with the mounting numbers that we were seeing of HIV diagnoses in Scott County and 90% of those diagnoses co-infected with HCV and what the cost of treatment would be. Um, and as you calculate it out, by the time that the outbreak reached 200 people with 170 um, who also were co-infected with hepatitis C, um, that was about 530 times the cost for an annual syringe services program at $71 million um, is what the cost of this outbreak was to this small community in Indiana. And compare that to just $135,000 that could have been used to prevent this outbreak altogether. This was something that was very useful that we sent out to advocates, that we sent out to scientists, that we sent out to other communities um, that were also in Indiana as well as neighboring states to show them the effectiveness of having a syringe services program. And then when you take a look at the economic impact of the opioid epidemic uh, in Indiana, it's really been huge. Um, there were data that were showing that the cumulative opioid epidemic in Indiana cost $4 billion between 2003 and 2017. And then in one year alone, the opioid epidemic cost Indiana $11 million a day. So, I mean, it's, it's nice sometimes to show what the economic costs are um, with some members of Congress and other policymakers to really sway people uh, to using interventions that make the most sense that need to be scaled up to prevent future infections. Other things that we do is sometimes in AMFAR, we use data visualization. This is visualization of COVID-19 cases and deaths across the U.S. You can see that the numbers are expanding and you can also see which states are becoming impacted and it's a heat map showing which states are most impacted over a period of time. We were just interested in taking a look at the exponential growth in March alone. And as you can see, um, it, we went very quickly from very few cases or deaths um, to this really just moving forward and the heat map getting darker and darker in specific places. Why this is helpful is because when you're speaking to policymakers, particularly, particularly policymakers from various states, it's great to show them what the impact is that's taking place within their states and to pair that um, with uh, people who are constituents from their states who could talk personally about how this has impacted their family. And that's something that's worked very well um, for many of us in AMFAR in dealing with various types of epidemics from opioids as well as HIV. And last, I just wanted to share a really important resource. This is a resource from Kaiser Family Foundation. They put together a very nice online tool that looks at state data and policy actions to address coronavirus. And they produce these interactive maps where you can look at cases and deaths, um, the trend data for cases and deaths by states, et cetera, um, and to see who's doing well at adopting social distancing measures, who's not, um, what are some of the health policy actions to reduce barriers to COVID-19 testing and treatment that's being implemented at each state. And then they also have a plethora of other additional state level data that's related to COVID-19. Um, I think that's one of the really amazing things about this response that quite frankly is different from HIV. Um, 30 years ago, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have um, this type of interactive equipment. We didn't have cell phones uh, where you can actually track cell phone data and do some other really interesting things. Um, we have that now. And, and those tools are incredibly important um, and something that scientists can use in addition with the data that we have to really help steer policymakers in public health um, practices as well as interventions that we know will make the most impact. And with that, I will end. Thank you so much for your time. I'm looking forward to the questions.